Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Chimshack. Today we have Tony Platt, uh, amazing producer, engineer, worked on such records or with such artists as ACDC, Foreigner, The Babies, Johnny Cash, Buddy Guy, Cheap Trick, Dio, Bob Marley, Billy Squire, tons and tons more. And we're going to be talking to him today about all of those records. It's so great to be able to be a, a slice of like giant historic records and you have more than your share. So welcome to the show. Oh, very, very pleased to be here. Thanks for asking me. And we're doing this uh, remotely on Zoom from uh, across the pond, of course, and it's really nice. No latency. I thought maybe we'd have a tiny little bit more latency, but I guess it's that whole speed of light thing. Yeah, it's pretty. it seems to be pretty good. I've, I've um, been doing quite a lot of Zooming, and uh, <clears throat> it took a little while to just kind of catch up with the technology and get it to work the way you want it. But yeah. Um, they've got it. I think they got it figured out now. They had a big peak, and I'm sure that it was like a, a big mess at the beginning. But they're doing. They've kind of caught up to that. We wanted to yeah. really. We want to hear all the stories, and I know you know. Maybe <laughs> I, I was wondering, uh, does Tony get tired of talking about the same records over and over again? It's like uh, we should all be so lucky to have records that sell 25 million. In fact, Wikipedia says that Back in Black, which you mixed and engineered, uh, sold. F- closer to 50 million worldwide so i mean for us mm-hmm. and everybody they want to hear about these records and i'm sure these there's these little records that you love that you want to talk about that you may not get to hopefully we'll get to some of those but you're going to have to forgive us because we're going to nerd out about all the records that you've done that we are just so entrenched in who we are as musicians well you know i, I way way back when it first when the interest first started i i was a, i was very kind of english about it you know and slightly reserved and uh, um yes well you know i just i just did my bit and all that sort of stuff and then i realized i mean <laughs> certainly the the one of the the motivating factors was uh, of course i'm i'm not getting royalties off all those uh, 50 million <laughs> records so um i need to kind of get my worth some <laughs> somehow so it's just a dollar you know, record telling the stories is Imagine if we just had a dollar a record. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Just, it would be lovely. Just right. Even even the uh, even a Spotify share would be pretty good on that lot. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just, and I know you didn't when you were doing the records. You know, zoom out to see what they would become. You never know what they're going to become. Uh, but it's like you're a part of history. I mean, you cannot talk about rock music or pick up a guitar. You cannot pick up an SG and not play Back in Black. You know, I mean, this is yeah. like. It's the yeah. biggest rock record. It's got to be the biggest rock record of all time, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly in my in my world, it's the biggest rock <laughs> record of all time. And um, I, what's really really cool about it um, is that it was a record that I really really liked. You know, the worst thing from a producer or engineer's point of view is that your most successful record is one that you don't really like very much. Right. Um, but, but, you know, that album for me was, it was fun making it, um, even under the circumstances we made it, um, you know, and they were great people to be with. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, the fact that it had that success was great. You know, you go into, I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. You go into an album, um, intending to make it, a really really great album and you work on an album and you think wow this is really really great and of course there are so many outside influences that d- dictate whether right. or not it's also going to be successful and this was just one of those circumstances where we made a great album and we we did all of those things right um and so did the rest of the chain um you know the record company the marketing and the pr and of course the band really did it in the end because they just went out and absolutely hammered that album around the world um and and how could you not like it if there was ever an expectation for a band to fall off that would have been it and here they show up with this record that was sort of motivated like like when um buster douglas beat mike tyson you know the the adversity (laughs) brought on maybe something that was extraordinary um Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, I, I heard a story about you, you were talking about how you had played the final mixes for your wife. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> she actually liked them, you know, and it's like, you said it was kind of a rarity, you know, you said, okay, oh, very this, much maybe, this, maybe this yeah. record will do okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was exactly it. I got back from New York and, um, and I just had a cassette with me basically. And I kind of put the cassette on and said, well, this is what we've been doing. And, 
we got to the end of the first side and she says, ah, oh, that's pretty good. I think that's going to do all right. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's um, so funny. She, she couldn't have been understating it uh, quite yeah. anymore, you know. <laughs> I, had a, I had an experience with my daughters when they were real little. I have two daughters. When they were real little, I'm talking like maybe five, six years old. Um, I was driving around in my <clears> car and I had back and black on. As, as you know, any good musician father should for his kids. So, <laughs> I was driving around, and this this particular car had a great stereo, and I can remember looking in my rearview mirror and watching my oldest daughter just like staring out the window. I could I could feel her taking it all in, <laughs> and at, at the end of when Back in Black, the song itself was done, she said, "Daddy, I think that's the biggest hit song I've ever heard." <laughs> <laughs> How old was she? She was like six. <laughs> But yeah, it, we, it, it is cool when your kids actually start to um, start to have the right appreciation. I remember coming back home once, and and my son was quite young, you know, and um, <clears throat> he, uh, I walked into the house and he was kind of looking a little bit sheepish, you know, and, and I thought, I said, what's the matter? What are you, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've been listening to some of your albums, and he got the vinyl out, you know, and he was listening to the vinyl. And um, and he was he was checking out Tom Petty and all sorts mm. of stuff that I'd got on vinyl. And I, I thought, oh, good, yeah. Well, he's going to turn out all right. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's great. Could you imagine your kid like putting on Sean Cassidy records and <laughs> no. <laughs> just like the, the, if you were a musician, how your heart would just sink? You know, yeah. you know. I get I was prideful whenever I walk by my son's room and he's he's playing like he's playing guitar now. So like he'll be playing Johnny Be Good or he'll be playing a Led Zeppelin song or he'll be playing an ACDC song and you silently walk away with a little bit of pride. But could you imagine if it was like, you know, trying to think of a big Sean Cassidy or Leif Garrett hit? Yeah, <laughs> that would be a real song, drag. The first song my son ever played live on stage in front of an audience was a, at a school, um, a school sort of music contest that they had and, and they put a little band together and they played Johnny Be Good. Yeah, and uh, it was a little stilted, but nevertheless, I can certainly remember all that, the parts that were there. Feeling of pride, yeah, all the parts were definitely the spirit was definitely there. That was all right. Good. I want to I want to geek out a little bit here, and I don't know how much you know. I, when I look back at records I did thirty years ago, I don't know how much I can remember, but I can kind of remember what my process was back then. But I want to ask you a couple of uh, <laughs> tech questions along the way, okay? So they sure. brought you on to mix Highway to Hell, then you came in and did Back in Black from start to finish. Um, yeah, tracked and mixed. Do you remember for Back in Black uh, that was recorded at Compass? Was it the VR yeah. that you recorded it on, or was it a constant? No, no, it's an MCI. It was an MCI. Oh my God, you recorded wow. that on an MCI? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. I didn't expect <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was. Um, you know, I, can't, I can never remember the numbers of the MCI. Never been my favorite console. Oh, nobody's. It was that flat the, one, right? Yeah, they had yeah. like the flat the, the, sort of mixing console rather than having angles. You know, they were just these flat ones, and they were yeah. kind of like the poor man's whatever was out at the time, right? You know, uh, yeah, nasty brown color. You know, and uh, <laughs> um, the EQ you had to go three times around the rotary on the EQ to get anything to happen, and uh, so it was. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it was really just a pathway to the multi-track machine. You know, it was. But the then people people get very still. I, I was having a conversation with Mark Ronson because he's got an he had an MCI in his studio in London, and and I was saying, oh, you know, he's, he was enthusiastic about this vintage console that he had, and I said, well, we weren't really that keen on them, you know. And he said, yeah, but we, you know, I'm a different generation. We don't have the same prejudices that you do. So it put it a little bit more into perspective for me. Yeah. Okay, so you had an MCI. And from what I can remember, I think that you, I heard you talking about that record and you said the band played as a band. It was always going yeah. down kind of as a full band, right? So Yeah. You know. the, when I mixed Highway to Hell, they recorded Highway to Hell in a very dead studio and a lot of separate uh, overdubs and, and things. And, and so um, when I mixed it, I... I fed it back out into the room at Basing Street um, through a couple of Altec uh, horn-loaded um, speakers, monitor speakers, and um, and then brought it back from the room to, to use that as a kind of natural chamber. And so I, I fed various parts of the drum kit and the instruments out to that. And that kind of gave me some ambient glue to glue everything together and make mm -hmm. it sound a bit more like everybody played in the room. 
So when we came to do Back in Black, I made the suggestion that we had a room that was big enough to get everybody playing live at the same time and, and we could capture some, some natural live ambience at the same time. So that was basically what we did. MCI console, was it to an MCI tape machine or what was the tape machine? Uh, goodness me, I think it was an, yeah, it may have been the MCI. Yes, yeah, with the drawers. Yes, it was an MCI. Okay, and, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe the most famous drum sound, I know Phil Rudd's the band, everything is, you know, critical to, you know, more than half of the sound, we'll say, but do you remember what mics you used on the kick drum and snare drum and toms? Do you remember all those? Um, yeah, the kick drum would probably have been either a U47 or um, uh, a D20, not a 12, a D20. Um, and the snare, I think around about that time I was using KM86, a Neumann KM86. Oh, wow. On the snare. Whoa, okay. That's interesting. And is KM86 a tube version? Or is that just a no? No, it's, it's it's the same as a KM eighty four, but it has that kind of ice cream cone thing on the top. Okay, and it's a side it's side firing, so it's it's really good for getting in on a snare drum because you can have it look right across the top of the snare. Okay, um, and was your D twenty? If you did use D twenty, would you have put that inside or like on the rim of the kick drum? Where does that live? Um, it would have been just outside on the skin. On the skin, and do you th was do you remember if there was like a hole for a kick drum mic, or was it just I, a front? I, yeah, I think there were there probably would. I'm generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of having a hole in the front of the bass drum because it stops it really being what you might <laughs> describe as a drum. Um, but um, but I think with that, we, we yeah, in fact, I'm absolutely sure we did. We had we had a, a hole on the front skin um, and a little bit of uh, damping inside the uh, kick. And, um, you know, it's so surprising because that kick drum is so present and you would think it'd be a little tougher, <clears throat> right, to get a mm. present kick drum, you know, the, the click that you hear in it, you'd be a little bit tougher. But I guess you'd put it in the hole and face it kind of towards out on the outer outside rim and face it in towards the yeah. beater. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, the, the thing with the bass drum, it's it's – uh, people get a little obsessed with getting the click on the bass drum, you know, and, and so a lot of heavy rock – music um the bass drum is incredibly clicky and doesn't really have a lot of weight um for me it was very much a matter of of getting air moving a column of air moving and getting really making sure that we recorded that column of air hitting the microphone do you remember your tom mics ah uh, goodness gracious me probably oh, uh, probably the sm7s actually because i had a I had a couple of those myself, so probably SM7s. Overheads? Oh, 87s. U87s? Absolutely, yes. And is that, you say that with, like, certainty. It's like, a, is that what you always use as overheads? Um, yeah, I've always... Well, you, you see, I learned to record drums uh, with um, the Glyn Johns method, which was two, two U87s and a D20. That was it. So um, for me, the starting point of a drum sound is, uh, is push up the overheads and hear what the kit sounds like. And if the kit mm -hmm. isn't sounding great through the overheads, you go in and you tune it and you get everything right before you start putting up the spot mics. And would you have used, used that Glenn Johns method on the ACD C record or the Space Paris? No, no. I mean, by then, the, the whole notion of, of spot miking drum kits um, was much more of a, a useful way to go. I mean, the thing about the Glyn Johns method is you've got to have a drum kit that's properly balanced. Yeah. And modern drum kits are not properly balanced. You know, the, the people that make them make them so the snare drum is louder than hell and, and so on. And, and it's so much more focused towards the live um, performance of the drum kit. So it, it makes it much more difficult to record with just uh, three microphones. And uh, what would you have used as a hi-hat? Uh, almost certainly the 414. Okay. And um, room mics? Uh, 87s out in the room. And I'm still kind of blown away. I mean, I was unprepared for you to say an MCI console. <laughs> um, it just goes to show you that it really all is like dude – 
comes through equipment, dude puts faders in the right spots, has the right concept for what it should be. And it's just sort of an extension of how you hear music. But that, that record is maybe the warmest and edgiest. And it's like all these contradictions and adjectives, you know? I mean, it was a, a record that wasn't lacking for anything. It didn't feel over compressed. It hardly felt compressed at all, but it was just always on fire. Well, you see, you get a you get a combination of things there. Um, the MCI console was wasn't really necessarily contributing a huge amount because I I wasn't doing much EQing on it. It was getting the right microphone in the right position. Um, so the console was just really directing the microphone towards the tape machine. And I mean, the other thing there in terms of equipment, you know, people the the MCI tape machine people are a little bit um, snooty about those as well but actually the MCI tape machine recorded really really well and I I was able to kind of depend upon that thing you, you record it on an MCI machine and then you play it back on an A800 which is what happened here and when we played it back on the A800 it was like oh there's the, all the sound is there yeah. MCIs weren't very good at playing back, but they were fantastic at recording. Oh, man, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, the difference between the A800 and the, eight, the 827 was that you had this really kind of beautiful, soft low end on the A800, where it became mm -hmm. a little bit more, a little bit less and a little bit more defined on the 827. So it's really interesting when you say, why wouldn't a tape machine have a big influence on how it's played back? It's got all of its own EQs and playback, you know, calibration. So... It's an interesting, yeah, yeah. you don't think of it that way. You think it is the way it is until you hear it back. Well, the, the A800 system. was the best, best multi-track machine ever made. You know, and why they went and made the 827, I really don't know. And why they left off the second output, for instance, you know. Uh, what it, do you mean the second uh, output? Uh, well, the A A800 had two outputs. Oh, you're right. You're right. Channel, and and that was that was especially useful when we got into the the age of triggering because you could you were effectively taking a preset. You could set it so you could have one of the outputs on on uh, repro and the other output on sync. Right. So you could get a pre delay um on on the signal and then bring it back in when right. you were triggering things yeah so back in the old days these triggers weren't as fast as they are today so what what we're saying is that you know one head would play before the other so you'd play it off of the first head and then you'd have to put it usually through a delay to find the yeah. right time yep. to get it Absolutely. to line up with the repro head yeah uh that was back in the days before you just put it into um trigger two and it worked flawlessly <laughs> without any knobs being touched Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you mixed that console in New York? Um, I mean, you mixed that record in New York? Yeah, Electric Lady Studio A. Um, I mean, that's where a lot of the warmth uh, came into the sound, of course, was, um, was using the, um, uh, the 78 series uh, Neve console in Studio A. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, the other... It, we have to also take into consideration the monitors that we were using. I mean, we were recording through Tannoy's, um, and and so that that enables you to kind of keep the bass tight but still have it feeling um, full in the room. And then then the mixing uh, studio was a Westlake, but a very very special Westlake setup. It was a, a quad amped, horn loaded Westlake room. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an incredible amount of, um, of accurate tweaking that could be done to get the room to sound right. So it sounds like there wasn't a lot of voodoo going down. It wasn't like a bunch of EQ. It was more mic movements and placements and mic selections. There wasn't a bunch of compression uh, whenever you tracked it. So it was fairly organically tracked. Not like you oh, very much, yeah. The the, the <laughs> probably the the most difficult conversation I had was with a an, um, a guy from one of the American magazines, and and he's he started off. He said, uh, "So what compressors did you use on the guitars on Back in Black?" And I said, "Well, I didn't use any." And he said, "No," and and um, I said, "Yeah, well, I didn't use any at all," and and he wouldn't he steadfastly refused to believe me you know he kept saying yeah now you must have used the compressor i said well i really i didn't i know you know and i was there um and and then eventually i said um yeah we were we were tracking onto an analog tape machine and i was pushing it quite hard so you know that kept it a little bit under control 
So there was some compression going on, but I didn't use a compressor. And all of a sudden you could see the light bulb go on above his head. You know, he suddenly, he, ah, right, of course, that's what it's all about. So do you think you pushed everything on that record to tape? Were the drums pushed hot to tape? Did you, was there certain No, things? guitars were pushed fairly hard. The bass, the bass was not so hard. Um, the the kick drum you would always push the kick drum a little harder just to to get it to come back off uh off tape um snare definitely not pushing too hard on that and certainly with the the overheads and anything cymbal like we'd be careful with that okay before we get on to the mixing of that record so for the bass it was a bass amp and a di do you remember the uh, yeah, he, um, Cliff was playing a Steinberg bass, and uh, I think we were using a um, um, a B fifty amp uh, Ampeg. You know the the one you turn the amp upside down. Flip top, yeah. Um, and the DI that was pretty much it. See, this, you, I mean, there, there, there's an interesting thing there as well, you see, because you can uh, accessing compression isn't just about using a piece of electronics. You can do it in lots of different ways. And, and so I had the bass cabinet in a very small booth, which was right behind the, the drums, because I wanted a little bit of bass to filter through and, and, and go on to the drum kit, just so that there was, uh -huh. there was going to be a spread of bass in the room rather than just a point source of it. But we had the door closed on this little vocal booth, for want of a better um, description. Uh, and because it was quite a smallish room um, and we had the bass turned up reasonably loud, of course, the room was providing a certain amount of compression, which yes. was coming down the microphone as well. That's so interesting. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, it disturbs me that when you say he's playing a Steinberger bass, was it the one with no headstock in the... Yeah, yeah. Like that... Like in my mind's eye, whenever you think of Back in Black, you think of a Fender Precision through an SVT, you know, 810 cab. You don't think of, the Steinberger is maybe the most, un, in my mind, it's just an uncool sort of like, maybe a guy from Chick Corea might play it. You know, I mean, it, yeah, it has one. It has one extremely good characteristic, and that is, you know, the, the most frustrating thing um, on a Fender jazz bass or a Fender position is that the the difference between the E and the A string is is like for, out of this world. You know, the it's always the the A string is kind of twangy and quite loud in the middle area, and the the E string is always less twangy and and quieter you know and and the thing about the steinbergers was that they they got the pickup situation really really working so it was completely even across the strings it just just blows me away you, you have, have a perception that kind of, of you know how that sound is made just because it's so massive and then you yeah. don't you get sort of tricked whenever you're saying that's what they played that on it's like mm -hmm. Angus it's kramer <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> global guitars he was had a global guitar endorsement um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and just a di on that i love what you're saying people don't realize this i have an iso booth at my studio where we put the drum kit it has a lot of nice early reflections and then i have a big barn and we put room mics out in the barn it's just glorious because you don't have any that's all the symbols that get crazy in the room mics you don't have that mm -hmm. but the yep. other thing that i try to explain to people is you get all these early reflections that feel like they're part of the original drum kit which is really nice feels like a steely dan kit right uh, it's mm -hmm. a lot of energy uh, but the room also compresses that drum yeah. kit and feeds it out the door like a compressor would and it's it's such a yeah. cool thing to hear that other folks think that way uh, but it's like it's a really you don't just get compression from a rack mount piece of gear you know? Well, no, and you know the other thing is is um, perspective as well. It's for me, it's always been really, really important um, to uh, to appreciate the fact that when you're mixing something, it's not just left and right; it's front and back, and it's it's low, mm -hmm. it's bottom and top. So you you know you really want to get all of those dimensions happening, and the best way to do that, I mean, obviously you can do that with various reverbs and delays and everything, but one of the best ways to get a, a handle on it at the beginning is to have some decent ambience that you can move move the um, the perception of, of the drum kit or the guitars or whatever it may be, uh, backwards and forwards or from side to side. Yeah. And to be able to do that with physical space is so cool because it's not repeatable. 
It's not like the same algorithm on another rack mount unit. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> of course, the other trick is um, leave it in the same timeline. <laughs> you know? What do you mean by that? It's, well, it's, I've been quite shocked at how many young engineers, um, because you can on Pro Tools, realign oh, the ambience. Uh, you know, uh, push it as if, yeah, a couple of pre, pre delay or, you know, putting yeah. it for them. Um, and you think, well, hey, why are you doing that? And they, they, always the answer they come back with is, oh, well, because of the phase. You know, and my answer to that is, well, then put your microphones in the right position so you're not actually inducing phase cancellation. Right. You know, don't, don't move the things because then you're actually throwing away the purpose of having the ambience in the first place. Right. It's supposed to be slightly behind the principle. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. Um, and the guitars, what was your primary miking setup for those? Um, we were using 167 and 187 on each of the, um, on Mal and, and the same on Angus. Okay. And where on the cone do you traditionally, are you moving that according to how dark and I mean, moving it, it according to the sound that we were, we were going for. Um, we, we had a lot of different amp heads and, um, so we, I mean, everything got reset for every song. You know, the, right. the drum kit, we retune the drum kit for every song because uh, we were tuning the tom-toms into the key of the song, making sure that the the drums were all within the same chord. Oh, um, wow. You know, because that, that relationship between the snare drum and the kick drum is all about having the tuning right, actually. Um, and so with the with the guitars, we were doing the same. And sometimes I would, you know, sometimes I'd have the the amp the uh, cabinet on a chair, and sometimes I'd have it on the floor, depending on how tight I wanted the bass to be. Um, and sometimes we built two booths, one for Malcolm and one for Angus. I mean, it was pretty much the same setup positionally that they have on stage um, with Mal on audience left and, and angus on audience right and these are 412 cabs i'm assuming or you're going to tell me it's a fender champ right <laughs> <laughs> no but pretty much throughout we were using uh 410s um the 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 uh, 412s rather the the most important thing about that was that they were the older speakers so they were the lower wattage speakers mm -hmm. um you know, with the, that's one of the things about Marshalls is that if you're using the, the 25 and 30 watt speakers and you're powering that from a 100 watt amplifier, you get the opportunity to crunch the speaker. Right. If you've got a 50, 60 watts, if you've got 450 or 60 watt speakers, you, you, the output of the amplifier is never going to get the crunch going. Now, you said that you were letting the bass bleed out into the drum room. Were you letting the guitars bleed into the drum room as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And how much would you say? Would you say if you brought up the room mics on that, how present would those other instruments be in bleed? On the room mics, um, very roomy. I mean, it, well, it, it wasn't a particularly high ceiling um in the room so um so there wasn't it wasn't like a cavernous um barn like uh ambience going on um it was just really to to be able to emphasize the spatiality you know yeah. you, you put that little bit of room in there even if it's not that far away and all of a sudden it, it blends the instruments together in a way that you can't do otherwise it shows real maturity i mean it shows like most people spend their whole lives trying to get instruments out of room mics and b from bleeding <laughs> on one another. And it's like, well, what, what if we put the room, what if we put our room mics a distance from the guitar amp that it made also served good use for yeah. an ambient mic for the guitar? It's well, you use it, you use it rather than trying to fight it, you know, right. uh, my, my principal mentor, Glenn Johns, um, you know, I mean, I, I watched him like a hawk whenever I got the opportunity to assist on his sessions and just, just watching the way he did things, um, was, was incredibly educational, but I, I, he was one of the first engineer producers that, that traveled around and used lots of different studios. And, and I asked him one day how he did that, you know, how he got used to different studios, um, 
even if he's only been there for a couple of days. And he, he said, well, the first thing you've got to realize is no room is perfect. Um, so you start from the premise that actually the room has got problems. And what you do is you listen to the room and then you work with the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, it's going to be fine. He said, the moment you start trying to fight the room, it'll fight you back. And then you'll end up in, in one of those horrible situations. That's brilliant. All right. So, and the last thing would be the vocal. What, what was that recorded on? U87. Uh, wow. You love U87, don't you? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's because it's the, the, well, I mean, one of the things is no two U87 sound exactly the same. So sometimes you've got to go through three or four to find one that's doing exactly what you want. Um, if I'm completely honest, I really like U67s better than 87s. Um, they have a, a little bit better uh, low end on them a little warmer low end on than the 87s do but it's the presence that you get from those microphones is just Mm -hmm. you can't get it from any other microphone do you have mics in your collections that were the mics that did epic records like that like you're just like oh this is the mic i used no i i um most of those lived at the studio well, I used to have a whole bunch of microphones and a whole bunch of equipment that I traveled around the world with. Um, and um, I, I got to a point, you know, when record companies were starting to shut budgets down and I sort of, I, I was going from the UK out to the States to do something. And I said to the the label, the A&R guy, you know, can you set up some transit for my equipment? And he said, oh, no, you need to do that now. Um, and it was basically the label weren't going to pay for tracking, trucking around. So I just took the viewpoint, okay, if you're going to play that game, I'll make you hire stuff now. And, um, <laughs> so I got rid of all my gear and, uh, um, and didn't, you know, didn't, didn't bother with the hassle of trucking it around the world. So yeah. a lot of those microphones that I had, the SM sevens and, and so on kind of went by the by. I was a bit blasé about it. If I'm oh, man, I would love to have been on that reverb auction. <laughs> like, buy all your old mics. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so, okay, you're mixing it on an 8078 at, at Electric Lady. Um, and anything special that you remember about sort of the philosophy? Were, did the record follow? The, the record, all the songs, you could tell they're song-centric on all the recordings of production, but the record has this continuity through it that just is what I loved about old albums. It felt like when you played it left or right, like this was like, this was very much um, homogeneous, even though it was so different. So when you're mixing this record, is it like, was there philosophy of like, oh, my drum kit gets a compressor as a whole. There's no compression anywhere. What's the general vibe if you were to look at that console and remember it? Um, I know that there was compression in the mix, you know, and, and the, the, the thing about compressing things at the mixing stage is that compression on one instrument is going to have an effect on other instruments. So, you know, quite often you're going backwards and forwards with things. Um, certainly there was compression on the overheads, for instance, just a little bit, because that's a great way of applying compression to the toms, the snare and the kick drum without actually putting it on the toms, the snare and the kick drum. Um, and, uh, and at that point I probably did use an 1176 a little bit on the guitars just to, to kind of bring them forwards a touch. Um, and you know, it, it, there wasn't a huge amount of of stuff going on there. And it's such when a you, powerful record. You know, people just yeah, assume that. Yeah, I it's mean, been... we we mixed. I, well, one of the things that I do have actually is the um, the orotones that we used when we were mixing. Um, road case orotones, the ones that wow. fit together. Oh and, yeah. Um, and I I had a pair of those, and I had. Um, um it's just down in the corner there actually a quad 405 amplifier um which i used to drive the orotones and we mix we would we got the sounds up on the big westlake speakers but then the blending of the sound was all done sometimes just through one of the orotones on top of the oh, console wow. really you'd really quiet. mono you'd use is, is that's typically how you'd use your orotone is a mono uh, we did for a lot of the a lot of the balancing, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, if I'm absolutely honest, it, it's not a particularly stereo record. 
You know, it's, it is quite narrow in, in a lot of ways. Um, but you can, that was, that's one of the parts of the philosophy of using two microphones on each of the guitars is that you can pan the, the two microphones out. So you're effectively getting quite a mono signal. It doesn't, it doesn't get too far around the sides, but you're getting the feeling of something coming from the outer edges because one of the microphones is panned out at that particular point. Um, and, and once you've got those positions in, then the balance, you know, don't forget we were mixing this, we were still mixing it for vinyl. Um, we were still mixing it for radio, um, you know, FM for the US, but there was still a lot of AM radio going on in, in Europe. So, um, Mono was so the important. whole mixing criteria were, were quite different from the one, the way it is now. So, yeah. Okay. So I've got so many questions about this since you've been from just a little bit, you said there, uh, when you're bringing up your drum kit, is it mostly overheads? What, like, how do you, when you approach those, let's say there's 12 faders there or eight faders or 10 faders, when you approach those 10 faders, what do you, What's your process? You pull out the kick drum and the overheads and then add the snare in a little bit. Was the, tell us how that works. It's never the same twice. I mean, the, the, <laughs> this is the, the question I get asked quite a lot. You know, will you come and do a mixing workshop? You know, and, and quite honestly, my answer has to be, well, I can, but you've got to understand I really don't know quite how I do it. Um, it's not something I set out with a, with a clear um, uh a brief in my mind of, of how to do something. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of even just persuading myself to kind of get into it. You know, you, you, um, and I would st I would start different mixes from different places, mm. but, um, at that point in time, what I would tend to do would be to just sort of push everything up and just listen where it was sitting all, all by itself and, and then go back and, and maybe start working on the kick drum um, cause you've got to remind yourself where it is in the, in the, the perspective of the, of the mix. And, um, um, you know, sometimes depending on what the bass was playing and where it, and how it was playing, um, you would, that would determine quite how tight or punchy the, the kick drum was going to be. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it needed to be a little bit looser if the bass was playing particularly tight or it needed to be tighter if the bass was playing um, much more sustained. Yeah, um, you know what you said something earlier that that um, that really resonated with me. It's like there's been times where I've changed the compressor on the bass guitar and it made my kick drum change. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. it really brings out. It really makes you aware of the ecosystem of what you're doing. That everything. It's not like you do turn this down and it. You know, you've got this equal and opposite reaction somewhere else. It's now has more harmonic content to do something over here. And it's interesting to say, yes, I love that you listen and start from different places in a mix because it's like, that's truly like someone who has a vision for something or is searching for a vision for something rather than going through a process where it's like, I always start with my kick drum. I always start with, and then I bring this in. And before, and at the end of the song, I bring up the vocal for the first time. You know, there's people that will do that. But mm. I, I appreciate in like, you know, whenever I hear someone talk about like, well, I just try to find what that song's about. What's the center of the song? And it may start with the vocal and acoustic guitar, if that's what it was written on. Um, well, yeah, you see, I mean, it goes back further than that. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that the mix actually starts way, way back at the front. The mix starts during pre-production and, and arranging of the song because so much of what you do at that point uh, informs the way that you record it. And then that informs the way you mix it and, and so on. And, and I don't really see all of the stages as being separate stages. They're just components in one long uh, process that you, you know, from, from starting the recording and through to the mastering stage. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff in, in the mixing process as well, yeah. Um, certainly when mixing for vinyl, you would do certain things thinking towards what you were going to do in the mastering room as well. Did one mix suit all of your outlets? Like when you were done, is there one mix of black, back and black that went to vinyl, that went to radio, that went to any other medium there was? Um, yeah, the mixes were the same, but we, we would do a slightly different um, master cut. Yeah, so it would jump out of grooves or whatnot in vinyl. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was not unusual to to do single cuts, you know, specifically to send to radio, and and they would send us a single white white label out to radio. Um, I mean, one of the things that that has irritated me um, quite a lot is that. Um, the original master that we created, um, the production master that came out of the, the mastering room, was specifically created for vinyl. Um, and my feeling is that when they came to release it on CD, they should have taken the original mix master and started again and mastered that for CD. But of course they didn't. They took the vinyl master and then tweaked it further. Mm. And and um, I mean, at least at one point when George Marino did the um, uh, the remastering uh, of the vinyl, um, what it was about ten years ago or so, it was just before he died. Um, he he at least went back to the original masters and mm. um, and brought that forward again. But it's it's one of those things that happens with so many albums that. Um, you know, the record label just get, they grab hold of any master that they can because <laughs> yeah. they don't know where most of them are um, yeah. and then master it up from there. Um, so when you're talking about the mono-ness of this record, when you say the guitars, so I need to go back and listen on headphones, but was it like both guitars were kind of center? I, my imagination would have think that, okay, Malcolm's on one side-ish. No, they weren't. Angus they weren't centre. The, 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 the two microphones. One of the microphones would be panned hard left um, on Malcolm, and then the other microphone was just sitting slightly um, off centre to the right. Okay. Right. And then with yeah. Angus's, it will be hard right, and the other one sitting just off centre to the left. Gotcha. So you get a spread right the way across each side. Mm -hmm. And that, so the feeling is one of there being a, a mononess. The guitars, in a way, are sitting in the middle. But when it really, the beauty of it is when you're listening on speakers, if you move around the room, of course, it moves much more like you were listening to a live concert. Yeah, I get that. And um, on your two mix, did you have what kind of processing lived on there? Anything? Uh, what, on the final bus? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. Mm. Wow. I, I, I got in for a, a period of time, I got into this whole thing of bus compression and, and sticking a, a, an EQ with some 12K on it across the, uh, the, the two track bus. Um, and then I found myself in a, um, a studio where I, they really didn't have a compressor that I wanted to stick across the bus. I tried a couple of out and it just wasn't doing what I wanted to. So I thought, okay, I'll leave it off in, in this particular instance. And, um, and then when I took the mixes down to Ray Staff to do the, uh, the mastering, he said, oh, wow, this sounds a lot different from your usual stuff. And what have you done differently? And I said, well, nothing. It's just the same old, same old. Um, but I, well, I guess the only thing I did was not put the bus compressor on. He said, great, leave it off from here on in. Oh, wow. Um, and it made me realize that certainly now, because the, you know, the mastering process is, is probably, well, it's just as important as it ever was in the vinyl days in different ways. And, and so what I really like about that, not compressing um, the mix, is that when I get into the, the mastering suite, I can, the mastering engineer can really work their magic on it, and we can use different compressors for different songs, you know, because mm -hmm. there are lots of different ways and we can use digital compressors or if that's working for the music or we can use analog um, compression if, if that seems to be more likely or a combination of the two. It just leaves you with so many more options, you know. Now you said it was a uh, 800 through a, a 8070 at a Neve. Uh, in your, was your mix down machine a half inch and what was that? Uh, that would have been, yeah, half inch Studer. Studer. And how hard did you hit that? Um, well, I always lined it. I used AG for 468 um, because it was the most um, stable of the tapes that were, um, were around at the time. I, th the 3M tapes had a tendency to vary a bit, bias varied a bit from reel to reel, and, whereas the AGFA was considerably more stable. Um, and you could, uh, we lined that up, I, I guess we'd probably be lining that up about plus seven. Seven, oh. seven over a 185 
just to uh, so what's that that comes out about 320 doesn't it something like that oh i don't know yeah i never yeah, I, I always got lost with all the nano evers and like it was like this one goes to 11 for me you yeah know, I, I barely was hanging on in the calibration world you know I, I used to know all of the different configurations, but uh, you know I've not used them for so, so long. So when you hit it, so you're a plus zero is a plus seven, so uh, that's pretty high because well, it, it was a plus six hitting. tape, right? It depends what you're hitting. This is the point, you see. If you if you line if you line the machine up hot, you're hitting the tape quite hard, but you're not hitting the um, the line amplifiers hard. Mm -hmm. If right. you line your tape machine up at normal. Um, that means that you're going to have to push the the line amplifiers on the machine. Very interesting. I never thought of that. Level onto the onto the tape. So it's it's much much better. The line amplifiers don't like being pushed anything like as much as the tape does. I got it. I got it. And um, so were you were you hitting this when you say you're hitting it at plus seven? So zero would be plus seven. Now how hard were you standing around zero? Or were you banging? Oh, off staying around zero. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, man. That's, um, is there anything I'm missing about that record as a post-mortem here? When you look back at it, is there anything critical that we're missing? Well, um, yeah, I mean, one of the th the, the snare drum sound uh, was, um, that was just a little trick that, um, that Mutt and I did on, on a few records. And, and that was, uh, we, we took a separate feed and we put it through um, a 910 harmonizer, even tight harmonizer, um, tune it down to about 83 and put the regen on um, and then the oh, anti-regen wow. on. So whenever the snare hit, you got this kind of sound yeah, and then you gave you that, that off. Um, so that, go that gave us a lot of bottom end on the snare drum without it being stuff that got in the way of the kick drum. It was very, you know slightly synthetic but it, uh, it had that. and you can I really mean, hear of, that on later like Def Leppard records with him uh yeah. you know you really hear it in that well the thing with ACDC was that they didn't mind us using effects but they didn't want to hear them so you know the the reverb and there are delays in there I mean there, there are delays on the electric guitars that you don't hear because they're just sitting back far enough yeah, you feel to not make a, a difference, but um, those delays, of course, rich. They, 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 what they do is they pick up the harmonics and enrich the whole sound of the uh, the guitars. Wow! I think my favourite story about the back in black mixing, though, that, that quite often leaves people a little bit kind of askance, is the bell. You know, because <clears throat> we didn't have samplers or anything like that at that point in time. And so I'd recorded the bell separately. And you must know that that story's been all over the world several times. Um, and then we, I brought this, the multitracks back to Electric Lady. And we mixed it down to a quarter inch stereo. Um, and then this was where Mutt's, um, Mutt's skill from his days in South African radio came in because they, they used to fly the commercials into radio stations <laughs> off tape machines. So they would, they would know how to fire the back the tape machine up and then they hit start and it would just pop straight into the commercial slot. So he was extremely adept at, at hand syncing um, tape in that particular way so i ran the multi-track and we we dropped them in one one beat at a time with with me running the multi-track and dropping it into record just a slight fraction before he he hit the uh, the tape so we we all of the ring the over ring was still there and it, it only cut off when the next hit came in oh, man. so every one of those bells is actually um flown in by hand that's wow, great. dude. And are that, is that uh, 2 inch 16, 2 inch 24? What was that record done on? Uh, 24. 2 inch and, 24. And how were the tracks a uh, commodity? Was it like you had, uh, not that there was tambourine on ACDC, but you had like tambourine and background vocals on the same track with a solo? And um, There were a couple of tracks, a couple of songs where we ran out a little bit. So there'd be a, a backing vocal on one of the tracks, you know, that... Um, and then there'd be a bit of guitar later on or something like that. So we, we did have a couple of those um, incidences. But um, generally speaking, you know, I, I, we got pretty good at bouncing things down. So um, 
you know with um with with the uh, the vocals for instance um the the normal way of doing it would be we would do maybe four tracks of vocal on a song and then we would go through the lyrics and choose line by line or sometimes word by word and sometimes syllable by syllable exactly which which track it was coming from mm -hmm. and then once we got that map on the lyric sheet i would then go through and compile um the uh the final vocal mostly by dropping in yeah because you, incredible you know. yeah, but it was like i guess he felt that uh uh, that the vocals were better done vibe wise from whole takes and then sort of making a doing I mean, your it wasn't punches necessarily whole off takes. the tape. No, it wasn't necessarily whole takes. I mean, we would we would do chunks of of the song, um, and then we would go back and we'd we'd repair a little bit. So mm -hmm. we always ended up with four takes that were great. Any of which would have been fantastic, and then we made the ultimate made take. a super take. Yeah, you know awesome. a, lot, a lot of dropping. I mean, the other the other story you might like actually, which I always forget um, until after I've done an interview is um, the ends of the songs, right? So the 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 ACDC way would be to have these l long ends, you know, boom, 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 <laughs> and into an into um, a completely kind of random space you know it's not like nobody's going one two three four bang for the last bang it's always when's it going to come when's it going to come which is great when you're in the room doing it live and everybody's looking at each other and nodding then when you come to when we overdubbed the solos angus would play the solo and then he would play rhythm guitar from the solo to the end because if you drop the solo guitar out, you've gone from two guitars to three guitars, you go back to two guitars, just, you know, left a hole in everything. So he would carry on playing. That's the only overdub, really, that, that was in there. Uh, but then we get to the end, and, and he had no idea where this, this last drop was going to come. So um, I thought about it, and, of course, he was playing in the control room. Um, so what I did was I... I marked on the uh the tape with a little piece of splicing quarter inch splicing tape exactly where the drop was and then i wound it back again and worked out roughly a kind of a two count and put that on there as well and then just took the head shield down and we would just run it <laughs> and, and you'd watch it and looking at it and i would go bang and then kind of conduct him in for the last uh, the last hit it's so amazing. What you think that now would be, no, nope, just play it, whatever, and we'll fly it around in Pro Tools is now is in the old days yeah. was just like, yeah. we got to re-engineer the wheel here to get this done. Well, you know, that was the wonderful thing about recording at that time is that because of the way, I mean, you know, one of the things I quite often say to students that I'm talking to is that um, everybody's kind of amazed at all these these techniques we had with uh, analog recording the fact is that most of the techniques that people really like most of the warm sound that people really like and all of those things were actually our responses to making up for the deficiencies in the recording medium you know hitting the tape machine hard was the only way to get the sound to come back again and using the compression of the tape was the only way to get the sound to come back again and that's what what it is that people gravitate towards mm -hmm. in terms of you know all analog sounds so warm and fantastic and everything it was actually just us making up for the deficiencies in the medium right coping with it yeah how interesting and uh the mutt lang stuff it's like you guys have done a bunch of records together um you know uh highway to hell back in black uh four and a four i'm sure there's many others that you did together so it's interesting and not that many actually there was a boomtown rats album uh, fine art of surfacing um, there was one album with a guy called Dickin that we worked on, um, and that was that was about it, I think. Such an interesting dude that's so. Um, I uh, my imagination my imagination of him because he's so sort of off the radar and doesn't show up much in interviews is that he'd be incredibly difficult to please. So why don't you tell me a little bit about how your relationship worked and why it worked with the two of you. And you obviously, you're at the top of his catalog in regards to records he's worked on. So it was working for him as well. How, what was that like to find a working relationship? And why do you think it worked so well with the two of you? Um, 
it's difficult to really kind of put your finger on it. Yeah, yeah, he's, I mean, he is a very demanding person and he's, um, uh, he's always looking for different ways to do things. He's always looking for, for um, improvements in, in the way of doing things. Um, I guess that was the, that's the main attraction of working with somebody like Ma is that um, you, uh, the expectation is that everybody's going to go the extra mile um so you don't have to sort of persuade anybody about that you just kind of get on with it you know and um i mean i think at that particular time it's another one of those circumstances where it was very much the right time and the right place you know um i we would i think the discussions we would have from time to time would be that mutt would want something to be the perfect feel the perfect playing and the perfect sound you know and and very often one of those has to give because mm. you know the, there are circumstances to be to be dealt with um so sometimes something wouldn't be absolutely perfect um but the feel of the whole take would be fantastic in, in which case i would i'd maybe say well let me just edit those little bits in and see whether that makes the take work for you and and so there would you know there would take certainly on foreign or four there were takes where I I just kind of went through and repaired a few little mistakes in there so that the take was was perfect enough for Mark to uh, to be happy with. Yeah, that's that's interesting, you know, because everybody needs a little bit of the yang, you know, if they're the yin, mm. you know. So they need if a guy that's struggling for perfection all the time, sometimes uh, if you can find a way for him to accept imperfection right get a solution you end up with something that's better than maybe what it, what he would have gotten on his own that's what we're all striving for when you talk about timing of a record yeah. you know yeah. you had told this interview in an interview you had told this story about not to go back to i want to talk a little bit about four and four but uh, you had talked about going to new york and playing the half inch master for the uh the marketing people at atlantic records for back in black uh -huh. Well, that was a, it was a quarter inch copy that I made of the album uh, yeah. to, to play. And I, I took a Revox and a quarter inch copy that I'd made very, very specifically, um, you know, um, and, and I had them set up a pair of JBL speakers in the marketing room. And, um, and it was just, it was, I mean, it wasn't my natural environment at all. And Matt, Matt and I were just feeling kind of completely, you know, we were, we were in the wrong place. And, um, so there's all these guys and I, I wandered around the room and I noticed that, that nobody was actually making any notes at all. Um, but when it came to the, the senior marketing VP saying, you know, well, what does everybody think? And, and nobody said anything. And then he said, well, you know, I think you shook me all night long is an obvious single. And um, one of the guys would say, well, yeah, yeah, I, I've written that one down too. And I, I knew that there was nothing on his sheet of paper at all. And, and then there was the other one that said, oh, I'm not really sure that that one will fly. You know, I thought that's a bit like the, the guy that turned down the Beatles, isn't it? Right. You know? How can somebody, I mean, I think that part of what I tell my friends and students, I have a school, my students is that we have the benefit that once you put in your 10,000 hours and you become the best version of yourself, you know the difference between what's really great and what isn't at least for you you know when something is really working and i really question all my experience over the years with record companies that you could sit in a room with <clears throat> tony platt and mutt lang playing back off an analog tape back in black and then have a group of people sit there and not be able to know like oh my god thank you for letting me hear this this is the best record of the next hundred years i mean maybe it's not that because that's what it became and it was just bigger than big but you have to know that that record how you're not at the end of that record either high-fiving each other or in tears <clears throat> it makes me question whether you should be in the music business i think it's very easy to to explain actually i think it, it's because it, the, don't forget the criteria that they're basing their judgment on is completely different from the criteria that we're using and um, they, they're going out. These are guys that are basically getting in a car and driving out to some little town in the back end of America and persuading somebody in a record store at that particular point in time that they need to take half a dozen copies of this album because it's going to be wonderful. Um, 
you know so they're 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 not thinking about it in that particular context what they're thinking about is how they can persuade all these people that they know that they visit on a regular basis to 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 sell them records um and don't forget that they're not just taking out a rock album they'd be taking out a pop album a soul album and so on and so forth so they're, they're taking lots of different musical styles sometimes into places that don't really um don't really like that particular style or they're going into a radio station and they're trying to to um to persuade a dj that's got a bigger opinion of himself than he perhaps should have um that that he should be playing this particular record and and you know so there's a lot i think there are a lot of components in there it's the the most important part of that process quite frankly is the is the marketing strategy you know at least in those days the people that were doing the pr would listen to the record and then they would pr the record that had been made mm -hmm. um too often nowadays what happens is the pr people decide the strategy they want and then they reverse engineer the artist into into that strategy yeah well, i think you're being way too kind to them myself <laughs> uh, and i guarantee you every one of those guys is uh walking around telling everybody about the first time they heard back in black and they knew it was a hit and they have all this you know self-appointed genius that they recognize it from the first yeah. hi-hat <laughs> it's like I knew a half a measure into that it was going to be the biggest record of the century. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we we had a band that was getting signed to Atlantic back in the day, and we were every um, every office we walked into, everyone was telling us, "Let me tell you how I broke Joel." Like every person oh. broke Joel on that floor. <laughs> of course. Like, Let me tell you how I broke Joel. It's like okay, guess what? Yeah, I guess you broke Joel. Uh, that's just inherently you know, people look back at it but you know it's like guys like you your philosophy with letting things bleed into the into the the main room not fighting things the maturity of like how to make records into your know, philosophy of just being successful at going with the flow of what the record in the studio and the artist wants to be that's just a there's a different level of command uh and man i just really respect the living daylights out of that and you see it a lot in guys like you that have been through tons of studios lots of organic long form linear records you know to base their next decision on you know we're missing that now I'm well yeah and, and you know the thing is what you have to do i mean the my philosophy's really grown out of realizing a long long time ago that you have to take people with you you know one of my little mantras is that i don't work for people i work with them and mm. um that's really important especially from an artist perspective you know um, there's a there's a, a lecture that I've done a couple of times at universities. Who's the most important person in the music business? And we go through, you know, taking it apart, uh, all the different jobs that you go through in the music business. And everybody's expecting the artist to be the most important person in the in the music business. And actually, what we prove by going through it and and deconstructing it is that the most important person in the music business is the customer. You know, it's the people who are going to buy it or they're not going to buy it. And, and really, that's the focus of it. Then with, without the artist, none of us would be there. But without the customer, none of us would be there either. So it's, right. you know. Man, the, the Foreigner record is such a seminal record, too. That's one of those records growing up that was, um, I used to wait around. They had the top eight at eight on WDV in Pittsburgh. And, and I would put my boom box up against the radio and you know you'd hear me do the record and then i'd get <laughs> after the disc jockey was talking i'd be halfway through the first you know intro and hear jukebox hero you know and mm -hmm. i mean to know that you were a part of those records uh, i don't i don't know if it's possible for you to know the levity of that for like a generation um i mean is that missed on you i mean uh, can you really feel like you can absorb uh, the significance I, of that I, 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 I absolutely, honestly, I just I kind of consider myself to have been very lucky to have been able to be part of those records. Um, uh, I'd sort of got used to it a little bit by then because of the Bob Marley records, you know. So mm -hmm. um, the fact that there was a perspective of being in the room, but then by the same token, um, uh, it's a little it's a little strange because i'd grown up in this studio the basing street island basing street studio where pretty much 90 percent of the projects that came through there were 
fantastic musicians with fantastic songs. You know, everything from the Stones, Zeppelin, Free, Mott the Hoople, John Martin, Nick Drake. I mean, every all different musical styles, and and but all absolutely superb. So we were a little bit blasé, if I'm perfectly honest. We we kind of, if somebody came in that was a bit we considered a bit below par, we were quite snooty about it, you know. Um, so I, I sort of grown up in an environment where um, it wasn't a matter of hoping for things to be good. You were expecting them to be good or not even more than that, you're expecting them to be great. Um, so, yeah, I think I just, I think it's, it's maybe, maybe a good analogy would be if you're playing in an elite baseball team, um, you expect all the players in the team to be, you know, at this at this level. Sure. Um, and but there's and also there's that muscle too in yourself where you like you zoom out and you see yourself like what you started off and what you wanted to be as a kid, and then to see like I was a part of something, I was a necessary part of something that that changed the face of recording history and music history. And there's got to be a part of you that that maybe can't even process that, right? I mean, it's just such, these um, records are so big. Yeah, I mean, don't forget, there's the other thing, which I'm sure you've experienced as well, is that, that it's it's like people say, you know, you become a movie director, you, you'll you never enjoy the cinema again. Mm. Um, and, and it's kind of the same with music. Once you become a producer and engineer and you're working on all these things, um, you don't really, I mean, I go to gigs, if I go to a gig with my wife, uh, it's very rarely because she doesn't like going to gigs with me because I'm taking it all apart. I'm not just standing there and listening right. to you know how the sausage is made. On. Yeah, she'll go to the other side of the room because she can't stand it. You know, um, so I think that um, I think that you've got that gets in the way of of any particular yeah. appreciation like that. But I still get. You know, I can I can still recall particular moments when I've been sat behind. Well, y you go through periods where you think, oh, do I really want to do this anymore? This is, you know, you're working with a difficult artist or you've been up 14 hours a day for two weeks or something, and, and it really starts to grate. And then there'll be something that comes along that makes you go, oh, well, actually, this is my natural habitat. You know, I mean, I remember one particular moment there's a studio not too far from where I live now called Great Linford Manor. Um, beautiful studio in a, an old English manor house with a massive great 80 uh, um, series Neve console, no, a VR console in there. And, um, and I, I, the artist I was working with had been particularly difficult and, and I was a bit low, you know. And the thing is that this desk, this console was there and then there were two huge windows right in front of me and then there was a um a massive great pine tree at the end of the garden that i was looking at and the sun was shining through that and i'm sat in front of this massive great knee vr console and all of a sudden i kind of got this rush of actually this is where you where you function best this is the place you function best of all hmm. so i think it comes through in that way rather than um, necessarily patting myself on the back for being part of, of great albums. It, it's, you know, it is very much that um, uh, all of the different components that go towards things that, that make it work. And it's like the, maybe this story w will help. It. When people say to me, can you get me a guitar sound like Angus? You know, and I, I, my answer to that is, uh, yes, I can, but we'll need an SG. We'll need a Marshall with a four by twelve cabinet, and by the way, we'll need Angus. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, because that's how it works. And 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 then when people say, "Well, what was it that you think you did on Back in Black that made it, you know, what it is?" and and quite frankly, it sounds a little bit trite, but actually, what I did was I didn't screw up. You know, mm. when you were when you were put in a room with a band like ACDC that's the thing that you you need to avoid is you need to avoid screwing up yeah i think that's a beautiful way to put it and um it's like what are we making today whatever's in the refrigerator it's <laughs> like let's make sure that we don't force our diet 
on yeah. the record. Let's just yeah. say, okay, we're going to take whatever's here and we're going to be we're going to be able to make the best meal out of what we have. That shows a lot of confidence in your ability and maturity. And I love what you're saying about not fighting rooms, not fighting records, not fighting the what's happening in the room. That takes an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable amount of maturity. And we'd expect it from you. And um, what we wouldn't expect from you is to be so humble and so kind about the legacy and the, what you've given to all of us. We're very thankful for it. So we want to, well, thank, well, you, thank for you for saying that. I, I, I mean, I, I, in a way, I don't see it as humble. I mean, my, my principal thing is that what, good moments are like um, I finished an album with this uh, jazz saxophone player called Dennis Baptiste, and, um, and we, we'd finished the mix and we'd played the album back and we went outside just for a breath of fresh air and he came up, he shook my hand and he said, thank you very much. That was the album I had in my head when I wrote it. Yeah. And for me, that was the ultimate thing that any artist could say to me. That's what you're trying to do, isn't it? You're trying to make the album that they've got in their head. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tony, I know, I know we're keeping you for a while here, but um, how, how did you come across working with Bob Marley? I'm a, I love Bob Marley. My daughter's named Marley. Like, oh, cool. So I, and I love Catch a Fire. And, you know, I'm, I've been really interested in that. I'm really interested in the, the rabbit playing on the record, oh, rabbit Bundrick yeah. playing on the record and how you guys took, I guess what was a local Jamaican sound and added the international to it. <laughs> you know, uh, I know that was, I'd read that that's why rabbit was brought in to bring some of that to it. Is that, is that accurate? Like, yeah, it was, it was an idea that Chris Blackwell, the boss of Ireland had, um, it was, yeah, he wanted to get he wanted to get reggae music. He, I mean, he's a white Jamaican, so he 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 had a kind of vested interest in getting the music he grew up with happening. And uh, he he sort of he managed to get a, a very poppy record called My Boy Lollipop uh, to be a hit in the UK. But of course, the the music that Toots and and Bob Marley were making was much more rootsy, um, and it just wasn't it wasn't really kind of particularly appealing, especially, especially to the core audience at that particular time, which was the American college kids. And so he, he thought, well, what are we going to do here is, is make it more attractive. Maybe we can bring in some of the elements of the rock music that they're, they're listening to, and we can incorporate that into the reggae. And then once we've drawn them in, they're going to love the music because lyrically it's fantastic, melodically it's fantastic, and, and Bob Marley is a charismatic performer. So that's really where it started from. Um, and we had the you know, Rabbit had, was always around the studio. I mean, we always, all the engineers at, at Island always had this idea that we'd like to be like Muscle Shoals. You know, we'd like to have a Muscle Shoals band, the Basing Street band and, and so on. Um, it never really completely happened, but we had certain players that used to hang around the studio a lot and played on a lot of different um, albums. And Rabbit was one of those people. Mm. And, and coupled with that, he'd also been out on tour with Johnny Nash, who sadly passed away a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. um, so he understood reggae. Um, which was an important factor in the whole process. So he came in. Um, he also had a, a, a very distinctive um, piano and Hammond style as well. Um, and we also had the clavinet. I, um, I always, I, I should do some research at some point. I think that was the time that the clavinet was the first time the clavinet got used on on reggae music so so we had all of these different elements and then we brought in wayne perkins um to put some rock guitar on it as well um and so it was a, it was really about kind of fitting those components together and making that work and you know what we ended up with was was like the beginning of concrete jungle it's it doesn't sound like it's going to morph into a reggae record it sounds like it's the beginning of a rock tune and then it opens up and, and away it goes you know um but it, it yeah i mean it was there was a lot of it was a voyage of exploration certainly it was for wayne were the, um, were the, were the were, was bob and the, the rest of the whaler guys were they resistant to this idea of adding these other no they were cool bob was the only one that was there when we did catch a fire oh, okay. Okay. and he was completely into it totally into it absolutely cool. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, have, have you ever heard the Wayne Perkins story? Mm -mm. 
we we were playing we were overdubbing him on one of the songs and and he he's he i'd played it to him a couple of times and he hadn't played anything and he just he held his hand up he's he's sitting in his studio next to his amplifier and he said uh tony could you tell me where the where the one is i mean he used an expletive in the middle of that but <laughs> and uh rabbit reached over and and pushed the talk back and he just said you just keep playing it the same way you'll find it <laughs> so i just kept running it for him you know and eventually he kind of led and and in fact what happened with that was he was sort of noodling over the front of the tune i think it might have been steer it up or concrete jungle he was noodling over the front of the tune trying to find out where you know where it picked up um, and, and I, of course, in those days, you're recording analog, you record from the top, you know, you don't miss anything. Um, so I kind of caught these little bits of, of guitar noodling at the front and we just shifted them a little bit just to make them uh, more relevant. And, uh, and they stayed in for the final mix. Wow. But I just thought that was so funny. It was, he was quite lost for a little while. You know? Did you know, did you have an idea at the time how seminal that record was going to be? And that was... No, I mean, I'd worked on quite a lot of reggae stuff, um, you know, Ireland being the label that it was. Um, and, you know, I thought, well, this is cool. I, I really like this record, but I had no idea. It, I mean, it wasn't actually massive when it first came out. It, 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 it started the revolution. But the first time I knew that there was something perhaps going on there was actually I was walking down the street in the place where the town that I grew up in, I'd gone home for a weekend or something. And a guy that I went to school with uh, shouted from the other side of the road and waved at me and came running across the road and said, Oh, I just got, I got an album with your name on it. And, uh, and I said, Oh really? What was that? I was thinking it was the Mott the Hoople album or something like that. And he said, Oh, Bob Marley and the Wailers, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. And I'd not even realized it was out, you know. And that was the moment that I realized that perhaps this album was going to go somewhere because this was a perfectly, well, I mean, he was a, an English white college student, basically. So, you know, maybe I thought at that point in time, we've kind of, uh, we've hit the right audience with it. Wow. It's truly great. Is there any record, we'll, we'll end on this. Uh, by the way, you're our longest podcast to date oh. <laughs> and we barely scratched the surface of the questions i want to ask you uh, is there is there any record that you thought and i'm sure there's tons of them but if one can come to mind that you just thought was going to go meteoric if that's a word you know just catapulted and you just thought this is going to be the biggest thing yet and it was just like never showed up um well, there's an album that I made in conjunction with a good friend of mine called John Porter, um, who, who's an, another producer. He's produced a lot of blues albums. He was in the original Roxy Music, and um, we'd made a couple of albums together, and, and we, uh, we got the gig to, for, um, to make an album with an Irish band called Light a Big Fire, um, and they were signed to one of the Virgin labels, Siren. And we made the album, we finished it, it was all mixed, it was, it was um, mastered and ready to go. The single was due to be released on the Tuesday, and on the Friday, the band sacked the singer. And the singer was a very integral part of the whole project because he had a very unusual voice, he'd written all the lyrics, and they just refused adamantly. They, had a, they fought, fell out over publishing splits. Oh. And they refused to have him back in the uh, in the band, and the record label shelved the whole album, so it never ever came out. And I still, to this day, I, I in fact I came a, came across it a couple of years back and played some of it, um, and and I think it's probably one of the best albums I ever made. And um, and I I've constantly been irritated that it never actually made it out into uh, that goes back to that uh, adage what's half a nothing you know it's like you can fight over yeah. something yeah. but it's like if it never gets released you know you can keep yeah. all or nothing or have half of something yeah wow well right. thank you so much you've such a such a great hang um i don't know if you get to nashville but if you come to nashville you've got to stop by and hang out i'd love you to see the studio and just to, to yeah i'd love to this would be great so yeah, I've been. I, there's a very good friend of mine, Dennis Weinrich, and he's he's friends with the guys at Blackbird, 
Um, mm. So we we talk about going out to Nashville on uh, on more than one occasion. We uh, we look we, forward to having you. And also, um, if people want to reach out to you, uh, maybe to work with you, uh, that would be through your management. Do you have a what? If, what kind of links do you want us to put in this episode? What's a good way to get uh, Yeah, out? I mean, my management would be the place to uh, Charlie. She uh, she looks after all of those things. I mean, I'm sitting now in my um, in my new mixing studio, which has has only been kind of happening since the end of last year. It was all ready to to market and and so on, just as we went into lockdown. So that's that's been a bit. In- do you have an MCI console in there? <laughs> no, no, it's this is a, an interesting hybrid, really, because I, you know, my the evolution of my um, equipment uh, fetishes um, has kind of taken me in interesting places. I, I have a Pro Tools rig out in the machine room there, which comes out from uh, there's a, an Avid uh, interface and there's an Apogee symphony interface so that comes out 16 outputs from that right in front of me here there's um a uh fire 5058 rupert need designs mm-hmm. um summing mixer yeah then there's a, a Lynx two two channel um a to d d to a converter here the Lynx helo and then over here there's a separate pro tools so this is my mix machine so it, it's replaced the half inch machine this is yeah. the mix machine so regardless of what i'm mixing uh what what sample rate i'm mixing on i mean mostly i'd record at 48 and most of the stuff people send me is 48 or 44.1 uh, but I can mix at 96K onto a separate Pro Tools there, which is what I then take to the mastering room. So you've got a, a high-res master um, gotcha. to work with. Okay, um, and that's Platinum, monitors. that's Platinum Tones is the name of the management company, right? Is that the name? Uh, no, it's uh, Urchin is the management company. Okay. But my, my company is Platinum Tones got Production. It. Got it. Okay, so we'll put those uh, all the links to your websites and and how people folks can reach out to you. We want to thank you for taking the time and being so humble and awesome and sharing all the knowledge. I've enjoyed it. It's good. Good questions. It's it's nice when you do one of these things and it's more like a conversation than a than an interview. Sure. Man. Well, hey, man, we're just glad to have you. And the other thing we should thank you for is all the inspiration you have changed. You've put more people in the music business than you realize. Those records are the reason, part of the reasons why I do what I do and Mike does what he does. So, uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. For very that, kind words. That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Signing off from the West Barn. Mm-hmm.